Welcome everybody and happy International Women's Day. My name is Kathy Corman Fry and I am faculty at the George Washington University School of Business Department of Management. And we have with us today, Lexi Young, who is an MBA student at GW, as well as Amy Errett, who is the founder of Madison Reed Hair Color. I know we have a lot of fans out there. People have been really anticipating this session and a lot of professors are actually assigning this interview to their class afterwards. So Amy, it's wonderful to have you here today. I wanted to give a brief intro and have you thinking about a little funny story to start off with. Um, Amy, in addition to being the founder and CEO of Madison Reed Hair Color, which is an omni-channel beauty brand challenging industry titans in the hair color space, they've grown exponentially over COVID. And she's going to tell us a little bit about that, as well as her role in the venture capital industry, which is really unique. She's a partner in True Ventures. And prior to Madison Reed, she was also a general partner responsible for the Bay Area office of Maveron. Is, am I pronouncing that right, Amy? Maveron. Maveron. Yeah, think and about Maverick. Maverick. Just okay, I was take thinking. The on at the I was end. thinking it Maven. The on. There's a lot of <laughs> no, good words. Okay. No, no, it's good. <laughs> and uh, then she was also CEO of Olivia, where she repositioned this travel business uh, as a complete lifestyle company. She also has worked at in senior management capacities a couple other companies you may have heard of, one of which is a company called E-Trade. And she is one of the Bay Area's most influential women in business. She's a finalist for Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year. She has a strong personal value in terms of the power of giving back. And she really dedicates herself to supporting humanitarian organizations. And we'll see probably today some of that value built into Madison Reed. So Amy, thank you so much for being here. Everybody's really excited. Um, the Thank chat, you for having me. Yeah, I have I a appreciate feeling that it. the chat's going to blow up today. <laughs> and a lot of questions. I've already actually got a lot of questions in advance of that. But first, I really wanted to, um, before I get you talking about your journey to being founder at Madison Reed and kind of what led you there, could you share a, a funny story, you think, just to kick us off a little icebreaker? Yeah, sure. Um, so I have this little part of me that's this kind of little wacky adventurer that does sort of wacky things. And uh, during COVID, obviously, that part has been quite suppressed. <laughs> uh, you know, so uh, I decided last summer to buy a boat. And um, so, yeah, there are so many funny stories that come out of that, including the first one uh, where the boat got put in the water and then I had a lot of surety about driving the boat, but managed in the first time in the water. I've been, I took lessons after this to hit another boat that was oh. parked. Um, and the Madison Reed was like, oh, mommy. Um, and why do you do these things? And, um, you know, it's a risk adventurer kind of thing that I have. Uh, but the funniest part of the whole thing was um, the, we happened, because it was outside, we all had masks to have a family that we're very close to who has a uh, very small child uh, who I believe was completely traumatized <laughs> after this, because every time the kid sees me, I can't make it up. He looks at me, he goes, Amy, on a boat? So that's all he talks oh, about no. is... Uh, I'm associated with smashing into another boat. So Amy anyway, on a boat. On a boat. On a boat. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, that's a little bit of a tidbit of an insight into uh, this kind of crazy adventurer side that I have that I have, you know, I like to go do crazy things. Since then, I've lied. Actually, I was on the boat this weekend and moved it from one space to the other and went out for two hours. So I'm getting better. I didn't hit anything this time. Good. So and no PTSD. No, no PTSD. No, but I only had another, I only had another friend with me. So, you know, they're an adult. So I, I don't think I traumatized them. <laughs> That's great. Well, I'd like to see, and I'm sure we will today, how your adventure side shows up, you know, in your life. And when um, Amy says the Madison Reed, it's because the company is named after her daughter and there's some great stories there. So Amy, can you sort of explain a little bit your path to being the founder of Madison Reed? Sure. Um, 
So there's a there's a thread that I'm going to weave through this because I'm hoping that it will be, you know, you I'm hoping that some something in what I'm saying will be helpful to people. Basically, um, uh, you, you mentioned a lot of different career paths, um, and uh, I've gotten to understand that I'm really bad at working for somebody else. <laughs> And that may seem funny in a way, but the moral of that story is kind of understanding where your sort of genius is in life and then positioning, as I say, luck comes to the prepared, uh, positioning yourself to um, achieve those goals because you're pretty sure about where your genius is. I like to think of things in four ways in life that I'll tell you the Madison Reed story, your genius, right? Your excellence, your competence, and your incompetence. <laughs> and um, when you can find something that's in that genius zone, genius to excellence zone, um, where you don't have to, I can do it, which is competent, or I just hate it is incompetent. So my, my weaving that tail is, you know, three-time operator, uh, became a venture capitalist, um, I would put that in the somewhat between excellent, but mostly competent skill mm -hmm. uh, and never felt, felt like uh, my genius was the person that was sitting around the board table as the CEO, not me as the board member, right? And yeah. I would leave board meetings yearning to be in that seat again. Right. And um, I started to understand that you know, even though it looked like you have all those things, venture capital is very intriguing and it's intellectually stimulating and you're meeting great people. All those things are awesome. And by the way, I'm a much better founder and CEO because I was a VC and because I'm still a VC, because I understand how the investors think and the rules of engagement, which are very different than people think. It's not just about money. I can get into some of that. But, but my point was, I just went to my partners and I just said, I am yearning to operate again. And that was the genesis of, I didn't know what I was going to do next at all. And as my wife would tell you, she so, saw me sort of getting what she called smaller and smaller and smaller about my passion zone of work. Uh, I was going through the motions and I loved it and it was great. And on the surface, very exciting. It's a lot of freedom, a lot of independence, but I was yearning for that thing. So I told my partners that I wasn't going to be part of the next fundraising, which is how funds are put together is their five-year life. And there's a fundraising for the next one. And then I went on a quest to find what was that thing that I could be passionate about. Now, I wouldn't tell you that my whole life I uh, yearned to to do hair color, right? Because I wasn't a cosmetologist. I'm not a cosmetologist. But what I saw when I was investor was this massive trend of CPG, consumer packaged goods, mm -hmm. starting to get disrupted by challenger brands in categories that had repetitive usage mm -hmm. um, that were huge. The total addressable market was huge and that had inferior products that could be re um, sort of what I would call recreated if you were just, you know, sort of following the trickle of water or how to make things. And yeah. I'll go a little bit into that. And we passed in our infinite wisdom uh, at on a company called Dollar Shave Club, which you probably know who was yeah. sold to Unilever for a billion dollars. Um, and it was one of the things that was actually, it was a very healthy debate inside our partnership, how venture capital works is you debate these things. And I really saw something there, uh, which stuck with me. And so when I decided I was going to go start something, I looked at all these categories and I wanted direct to consumer. I wanted something that could have mission and purpose that I could care about. And I, at the same time, uh, this is another little bizarre story. I was in Whole Foods. Mm -hmm. Uh, and had a uh, Saturday list of shopping. And my wife texted me and said, could you buy me some hair color? And I said, um, at the meat department, where, where do you get that at Whole Foods? <laughs> uh, and uh, it was in personal care. And I went over and I said, what color? She said, oh, she's black, dark, dark brown, black hair, the darkest color. And I said, Claire, is her name? Claire, you've been going to a, a 
a stylist for years. She said, I don't like, I don't, I'm feeling like I don't know what the ingredients are. I'm feeling like I don't understand what he's repetitive. She has to get her hair colored every two to three weeks, right? So a mega user, very white. So I look at this box and I'm like, what is this? And, you know, I pick yeah. it up. It's got dust all over it. Uh, I happened to go to Walgreens next to pick up some prescriptions. And I just literally, I walked in down the hair color aisle. Now, how, now have any of you ever been in that hair color aisle? It yeah. is a blank show, right? I'll let you insert the word, um, but it is, it is, it's dreadful. I mean, you have no idea. There's no advice. There's no differentiation. There's yellow tags of what's on yeah. sale. There's a if picture you, of somebody who looks like Sarah Jessica, Jessica Parker, but is it Sarah Jessica Parker? Yeah, and, and, and it was probably taken 15 years ago, right? Right. And, you know, dusty <laughs> boxes and some on sale, but... And if you ask, because we have data, the average woman that buys a box of color on the shelf, what they use, very few really know. Really? They're like, I think it's L'Oreal, maybe it's, you know, Garnier, maybe. So I just, again, the little yeah. bit of the crazy, I bought like 40 boxes. It was the beginning. It was this the random beginning. act of nutsness, which by the way, you, this is a common theme you're going to hear is that when people start this, they're not, it's not rational, right? It's not like, because when anybody asks me, well, like, whoa, that's really risky. I'm like, yeah, that's why you do it because you see something and yeah. you decide that that's the North Star. So I bought 30 boxes. I came home, <laughs> Claire's like, oh God, here we go again. And, you know, I put them up all the table, took them all apart and they um, literally were, it was, unbelievable the instructions were this long um one point font one point font in many different languages so no women reads it and then you know terrible gloves terrible componentry nothing's recyclable horrible smell right because of the right. ammonia so anyway the long short of it i looked at it and i it was like something clicked and I just said, someone's got to, I went online and looked and, you know, there was like one competitor that I didn't even, it wasn't really well done. And I just thought, okay, I'm going to find out how to make hair color. That's amazing. Cause there's a couple of things I'm taking out of this, which I just want to reiterate. One of which is for students listening um, and PS, for those of you on the Facebook live stream, I'm not going to be able to see your comments. So if anybody's on the Facebook live, live stream, like I'm in, and you want to put the comments in here, great. Otherwise, I can only read the, the chat here, which is starting to blow up. Um, total addressable market for the students listening is basically yeah. the kind of stuff we study in class, right? Mm -hmm. How much money? How, what is the possible market? Exactly. And what slice of that could I get? Exactly. And then another thing that we talk about a lot, which I hear you saying, Amy, is this, this sort of click feeling or this light bulb going on. And yes. this seems common in some of the more successful entrepreneurs, maybe all entrepreneurs, where they just sort of have to hunt that down. It's, exactly. It, it gets inside their brain. Um, and then the last thing, which I think will, will come out, and we're already getting some questions about this, is how you decide you're going to take on something that really you don't have experience in, but you're mm -hmm. so intrigued. And this is the falling in love with the problem. Right, like Amy's wife is saying, look for the look for the hair color in Whole Foods. I don't know what ingredients are in my hair color. And then Amy goes down the the aisle at Walgreens, and it's just like an out of body experience. And she finds out it is for everybody. And and if you see how the the equation starts coming together. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. And and one other thing, if that's a great framing, Kathy, because as a VC, so so here's where some of the things that I learned kind of overlap, right? Okay. Um, there are three things that a venture capitalist in early stage looks at. Okay. Right? Like, let's assume you don't have a product yet or it's super early. And I've always done early stage investing. I'm not, I don't like later stage investing where it's more just metrics and numbers jockeying, right? Like I just, it just doesn't interest me. I like investing in the, in the sort of bizarre dream that somebody has right? <laughs> and helping them. And the three things I look for, people look for are TAM, total addressable market. Is it big enough to give venture returns? Okay. Right. This is a very important factor. That does not mean if it's not that you shouldn't do it. 
it may mean that you shouldn't take venture money. Okay. Right? Because yep. people can build great companies, 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollar revenue companies where you make a ton of money, but you own most of it and never have to take dilution. All right. And there is no shame in that. And in fact, 90 some percent of companies in the US started never take venture money. Mm -hmm. We just live in a world in Silicon Valley and now more in DC and New York and Boston where ve entrepreneurial venture money is the thing that people think about. But the truth is plenty of businesses are incredibly good businesses, but shouldn't take venture money. Right? Okay. So let's hold that. So the TAM. Then the second thing is the product innovation. So what, what is the reason that this business would be different than something else? Sometimes it's a brand new market where no one understands. It doesn't exist. And I could give you plenty of, you know, Twitter didn't exist. Like nobody, you know, 140 characters. I, of course, passed on that. So you can see, the, you can, you can see the story that's building here. You yeah. can see what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, and you know, the issue is that that is 140 characters like who and, you know, Twitter, it's now a staple in our life, right? right? Facebook, you know, MySpace sort of existed, but Facebook took a very different approach, right? So there are things that I would call blue ocean that are out there, but hair color was a see an opportunity to exist and change it, right? Disrupt it. So in our case, the thing that was different that I also saw that it's important was that when you go down the aisle of Walgreens, there was no advice. There is no color matching. There's limited change so, and the ingredients suck. So I knew that if we had made better ingredients, took out the harsh stuff, could figure that out. Yep. If we could use technology, which is the big unlock, by the way, in almost every business now, think about this. If you're running a SaaS business, you must have an insight to application on somebody's phone that uses it, right? If you're a consumer company, we all live more on our phones than we do anything else. So we, we had to figure out how to color match you with technology. And we built an 18 question algorithm, which is kind of a quiz about your hair and your desired results. And behind the scenes, there's 17 million hair profiles now right. that it's matching against. Yeah. And saying, okay, here's the three recommended shades. We have 60 shades where our competition on the shelf has eight, right? So we got it that we needed to have more selection. And then on ingredients, we have an eight free formula. Um, so we had product, right? Innovation. We had technology innovation. And we had what I would call convenience and access in someone's hand yes. where it could be delivered to their door and all those kinds of things. And then we use content videos to teach you. Education is becoming this incredibly important part of everyone's business, but the DIY market, the do-it-yourself market needs to have that. Um, and we also have hand-holding. We have certified licensed colorists who are on call constantly, chat, email, phone, now video consultation. So if you come to exactly. us and you want a licensed colorist to look at your hair right on Zoom, mm -hmm. well, we don't, we use our own technology. We built that and then have a 15 minute video consultation that you could actually uh, book in 15 minute increments and then say, oh, you're thinking about this. Let me tell you about this. Here's gloss, here's other products. So anyway, the long and short of it is what a venture capitalist is gonna look at, TAM, product innovation that's different, disruption. And then the third thing, is people. And that is, I would always take one out of the three other risks, but it would never be people. Because people, you know, this is everything that we talk about, and right. we could talk about strategy and, you know, the entire deal comes down to your people, always, forever, and ever. And if you lose that thread in your mind, it, it, will, it will hurt you because every single company, really, at the end of the day, it's all about people. It's about who do you hire? Do you have a culture? Do you, um, do you know what those cultural values are? Do you articulate them? Do you put people through a lens of seeing whether the way you have the culture meets the person's value structure? These are critical. And so the people thing, is I would never take a people risk, but I would take a product risk or I would take a TAM risk because this is important. 
if you do a really good job, your TAM can increase because you may create more of a market than existed before. Yeah, you become a market maker. Exactly. You could bottle water that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and you know, there's plenty of stories of, you know, my friend Kara Golden has hint water. I'll give her some props, right? She's a good friend. Oh, and she stopped, you know, she didn't want sugar in her drinks anymore and found a way to put not non-caloric, good for you flavor in water called hint water. She mm -hmm. had a problem. I had a problem. I had somebody in my life who was unhappy with a product saw a market. And then I just started to talk to people. Literally, that was step two. Like all the women I knew, I started talking to them. I waited till they had a glass of wine first. Typically. <laughs> and you didn't As take in, them on your boat. No, I didn't. I didn't have a boat then because then they didn't, they wouldn't want to talk about hair color. They'd just be absolutely terrified. Um, but, but my point was, is that I started, you know, when we used to be able to go to restaurants, remember that, or have people over in your house for dinner, that'll come back. I would start asking real consumers, women 40 plus, do you color your hair? How often? What do you do? You go to a stylist. Why? Um, anyway. Yeah. I mean, uh, the reason I love hearing this is because, I mean, I have a 30 year background in the corporate world before I uh -huh. really went whole hog into academia this year. And you say things to students like it's all about people, you yes. know, be in love with the problem, things like this that are little bumper stickers of teaching. And then when you come back and say, yeah, that's how we run our company. That's totally. how we've been successful. This is a must. It's, it's really great for, you know, the budding entrepreneurs out there and even some of the entrepreneurs who maybe are just busy, you know, how you get busy with just doing stuff. And then it's hard yes. to say, what should I really focus on? You've sort of outlined that for us, which is really. Yeah. Great. Uh, one last thought about that is, you know, the way I think about things and we could talk about a lot of stuff about self-care and, you know, there are, when you're in this, and when you're in this run, as I call it, taking care of yourself having time to think, which is not how we are typically wired as founders and entrepreneurs, but having that time. And the reason, you know, I meditate every morning. The reason that I've learned to do these things is exactly, Kathy, what you said, which is like every morning you need to come up and get up and have your North Star. Mm -hmm. What is central to your being of what you know? Yeah. And then no matter what gets thrown at you, yeah, you'll weave and you know, people talk about pivot and it's never, and I can tell you anything you start is never ends up the way you thought it was to be, which is good because right. what that means is that you are, you know, I always tell people, a f you know, flexibility, not so good as an entrepreneur, because then people will tell you something and you'll whipsaw yourself back and forth, but agility is the key. Got it. Not flexible. Flexible just means I'm going to, right. I'm loose agility, which is I'm paying attention and I'm willing to move the course, gather data, iterate fast, fail fast. Failing is your best friend, best friend. Right. Which is really interesting having, so, you know, GW is a very international school and we've got a lot of folks around the world who are tuning in to this right now and failure isn't always okay right? In, in different cultures, the American culture does have a particularly weird badge of honor at this point around failure, especially for entrepreneurs. And so it's good to sort of pass that along, that failure is your best friend. Uh, it is, well, first of all, uh, there's so many parallels to your founder story with just life, right? Like, yeah. here's the thing that I tried to explain to the Madison Reed, you know, who's 18. Like, uh, the lessons learned in life are the path for your strength and your conviction. And everything that happens along that path is a gift. Because what it's really saying is like, if you have the courage and the, and the uh, openness to accept the things that happen and then learn and integrate and become more aware that life is, you know, as uh, I have a saying that I talk about, which is, uh, your amount of gratitude equals your amount of happiness. Yes. And the research shows that. <laughs> Absolutely. And so in your companies, mm -hmm. making sure that people understand that failure is okay. There is no blame. It's as I call it, because I'm a sports person, next game. 
and every single winning team, because I'm fanatical about sports, mm -hmm. was a was not so good, not a good team in the beginning, not a good team. And the reason that they're a winning team now is because they lost before her. Yeah. And that's pattern recognition of how did that feel? What did we learn? Positive attitude, next game, let's keep on going, right? Yeah. And then right. all of a sudden you wake up one day and you're like, oh my God, what the heck happened here? You know, it's, as I call it, you know, building a comp company is uh, like everything else in life, gradually then suddenly. Yeah, well that, <laughs> and, uh, and we do have a question about COVID, so that'll come yeah, up great. In, a, in a second. Let's do it. But I know um, Lexi is a follower of Madison Reed and is a big fan and also focuses on sustainability um, in some of her past and, and current jobs. Mm -hmm. And so, but Lexi, but that's it. Lexi, you can ask what you want. I'm just teeing, I'm just teeing you up a little bit, but. Great. Yes, yeah. great tea. <laughs> Thanks, Lexi. Um, Amy, I'm so excited to speak with you. Thank you so much for your time today. Uh, you touched on, and going along this thing of sustainability, you touched on the amount of harsh ingredients that are found in hair products on the shelf. And Madison Reed is known for their high quality, smart eight free formula. And I wanted to know, what is that? Can you explain it to our audience? Why are you passionate about tackling this problem of harsh ingredients? And why should we as consumers care about this problem? Well, the best way I'll describe it is it doesn't make sense that if you're using another uh, hair color or in a salon, that your eyes tear, your head scratches or people or your salon person's putting sweet and low literally in your hair color because that is if you've ever had a reaction to hair color which by the way 15 percent of women have some allergy you're not supposed to itch and burn and blister okay so you know the way that i think about it is there was there's some things we've taken out that are quite obvious ammonia PP, ppd is something that in darker colors tends to uh, be used to keep the color stabilization. We take it out because it's one of those things that people do get allergic reactions to. Um, you know, uh, gluten, people are like, well, I don't eat my hair color. Well, let me tell you something. If you have celiac disease and you have gluten, which most hair color has gluten in it and you're putting it on your scalp, your skin is a, you know, part of your body. You're gonna have some breaking out. So we take out gluten phthalates, you know, um, resource and all, right? So we did a ton of research. Now I want to be like crystal clear with people. People say all the time, well, Madison Reed's organic. It's not, it's not organic. You cannot, when anyone tells you that permanent hair color, this is not demi-permanent, this is permanent hair color is organic or natural. It's not. You must have some chemicals in because you need an alkaline and an acid. You must at the, well, I always do this wrong right there, at the root <laughs> of your hair, right? When you put permanent hair color in, you're actually opening up the cuticle of your hair at the root line, inserting color and then sealing it back, right? It doesn't coat the outside of your hair permanent color. It actually goes in the hair cuticle. So you can't do that naturally, organically. So I'm always the first to say, it is not organic and people can't make organic hair color great if they can now that you could you can substitute as we've done a lot of things with plant-based kinds of things which we do so why is it important it's on your scalp you're doing it the average woman colors her hair you ready for this 32 years wow every six weeks wow so whenever anybody asks me about the total addressable market i'm like are you, are you you know, and it's no offense. I'm not trying to make a gender. It's International Women's Day. So yay for us, by the way, a million for everybody else. One day, yay for us <laughs> um, is, and this is not a gender. It's mostly guys because it's not relatable that are like, how big is that market? And I'm like, dude, are you talking to your significant other? Because she's <laughs> tortured, not just during COVID, but in real life all the time, like, oh my God, I can't go out of the house. I got to put a baseball cap on because your roots are showing, right? So it's a long-winded way of saying these products are important. Why did other companies not do this? Because it's hard, by the way. <laughs> we needed to go to the EU to find people who believed me. And I have a ton of funny stories with people like, 
you know, of, of contract partners who I sat and pitched this idea to in the beginning. And they're like, you're crazy. Nobody buys hair color online, first of all. And why do you have to take all this other stuff on? Women don't care. They just want to look great. It just, mm -hmm. they just want it to work. Now, remember, this was, it'll be seven years of this coming summer. So seven years ago, they might have been right, where people are like, no, I just cover my gray. And I was sort of like, no, I'm not going to just do that. You could buy some other box. We have to do this in a way that we feel good. So very long-winded way, Lexi, of, of answering your question. That's awesome. I love how passionate you are about it um, and how Madison Reed reflects those values that you find important. Um, you mentioned earlier that your company has mission and has a purpose. And when I think about starting my own company one day when I graduate, I want to do the same thing because it'll feel like an extension of me. So with that, what other personal values do you have that are embedded in the mission or framework of your company? Yeah, so uh, the reason I use this Zoom background uh, is I try to have people strain their eyes to read what the heck is on there. But here's the, uh, here is the takeaway from this. Um, you know, go ahead and let your inner badass shine because women who are confident can change the world. I love it. So here's the, here's the thing. Um, I taught, I, I, I didn't, I didn't plan this thing. I'm going to tell you, but it has happened a, a number of years ago, a, a teacher, uh, that the Madison Reed had, uh, in sixth grade. Uh, and he was a wonderful guy, went to another school and called me up when he moved to another school a couple of years later after I'd started Madison Reed and said, would you come in and talk to the eighth grade girls? And I said, you know, Todd, I'm really, you know, I'm busy and no, no, go talk, come talk to them. Cause it's a pivotal time in their life where they're, they've already gotten a ton of messages, but it's this time in their life where they're going to make choices and they may be unconscious, but they're conscious. I said, okay, what do you want me to talk about? He said, I want you to talk about, you know, being a badass CEO and not letting anybody get in your way. I said, all right, I can do that. So uh, I went to talk to the eighth grade girls and I spent hours, I mean, many more hours preparing for this than I've ever prepared for anything because I really wanted it to be meaningful for them, right? And so I had done all this research about what happens with young girls. And one of the biggest issues is media. I apologize, I have, it's a bad, I have solar being put on my house, so I'm gonna try to get through this. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, I said to them, hey, listen, uh, when you're three or four, why uh, do any of you wanna be a princess? How many? And they all raised their hand. What's your favorite color? Pink. What do you want to wear? A tutu. And I said, okay, well, explain this to me. Why do you think that is? And they said, because of Disney movies, because of the media. Um, well, you know, in eighth grade, if you're really smart and you're in a, in you, there are boys and girls, do you raise your hand for something? And there was like complete silence. And I said, so I'm going to share something with you is you're smart. You could do anything you want to do. If you want to wear a tutu, that's great, but you don't have to buy into being a princess and being, um, you know, needing the prince to be the one that makes things happen in your life. You are responsible for your life. You have the power to build a company, be a professor, be a doctor, be a lawyer, be a psychologist, be a full-time mom if that's your genius, but do never let anybody define you. You are able to make your own path in life. And so the truth of it is, and now like I'm, I'm on the eighth grade circuit, um, you know, so like, you know, listen, if this hair color thing doesn't work out eighth grade. Okay. Girls, okay. Uh, I'll be your agent. Okay. Okay. But my point about it is you asked about the values. What are the values? I want our clients, mostly women to come first. They are lowest on the food chain. We don't take care of ourselves. We are the connectors, the, you know, we, that's the role, right? And I want this company to stand for great ingredients, convenience. You know, we have, if you don't want to do your hair yourself in the DC area, we have four hair color bars, more to come, right? Where we apply the same color, Madison Reed hair color bars that we sell you, right? That we make and manufacture all on the phone, all enabled, you know, click, get an appointment. My point is that like, I want the 82% of people that work for Madison Reed are women. 
53% are people of color. I am convinced that diverse companies um, actually have better outcomes. So at the end of the day, what do the values stand for? I want every woman in the world to be met exactly where she deserves with great ingredients and be confident that she looks in, your hair is emotional. It's emotion. Your hair looks great. You feel like lights out, right? So that's why I call it a good hair day or a bad hair day. So my point is, long-winded point, sorry, is confidence and what goes into that and the values of the company are, you know, a lot of humanity, a lot of courage, a lot of love, a lot of trust, a lot of you come to work for us and we mean what we say that we're on your side and we're going to do everything we can if you give us your gifts and your talents to make you successful. You're accountable for that. But at the end of the day, we mean what we say. And we've had great success at that. That's amazing. Thank you. Right, Lex? Isn't that, it's so great to hear this. And number one, people are really in need of some inspiration right now. And it's so uh, wonderful hearing about a company that's really trying and doing the right thing for us. Right. And literally Absolutely. us first so that we can put yeah. ourselves first. And self-love. It comes... It's like, um, I don't know if there's any message to leave you with, and this is, um, you know, find that genius and you deserve every part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A thousand and, percent. And yeah, it's, I like the, the message of sort of how you uh, came into the company and how it sort of like caught fire and you couldn't let go. And then different things helped to build that story in your mind and different experiences and it fit into your background uh, in the venture capital world. And it's like this Venn diagram, right? And then you are talking about the values the company has, the ingredients. And just, I wanna reiterate the process, you guys, cause I see we're getting a couple of questions about, you know, why have I not heard of this brand? And it is one, <laughs> it, it's, and then a friend, of, a friend of mine who actually co-teaches with me says, this was me. I had no idea of what brand of hair color to use until I used Madison Reed. And now she's like Madison Reed for life. So you get online, you go through a quiz. It's very intuitive. It's, it's deceptively simple when you talk about everything that's going on behind that. And it makes complete sense. You click, it gets sent to you. And then we see this cool mission in the background. It arrives in this box. It has purple gloves, very cool packaging. The whole thing is just this experience. You feel really good about it. And I don't, I'm not like a great hair color person in the sense that I didn't grow up doing anything with my hair, like I had brown hair. So then when COVID hit and it was time to do hair color and take over for my hair colorist that I'd been using the past couple of years, I, I didn't know what to do. So I did go to the Madison Reed color bar. And that was an experience also talking to your folks, um, the manager of that one, who also is a volunteer firefighter, talk yes. about badass said you personally oversee so many of the hiring decisions she says i'm going to work for madison reed for life we see what you're saying is true and is really pushed down to all levels of the company so here's my question right covid hits yes you guys grow to be a 100 plus million dollar company yes and i know the role the pivotal role that you play in hiring Yes. How do you, how do you scale? You know, the orders start coming in. Yeah. People are freaking out. How, like, how do you do all of that? Yeah. So um, first, thanks for the kind words. Cause when you're in it, you're just, you know, <laughs> your head's down executing. So every once in a while popping it up at 30,000 feet, it's nice. Um, so two, two parts to the question, right? So as I said, luck comes to the prepared. And I mean that. And so, you know, we didn't plan COVID that, you know, that wasn't, you know, for me. I, so the first thing I want to express is I am humbled that lots of people's companies, in particular women, you know, really have lost their jobs. Um, yes. You know, this has not been like having a company who explodes is the opposite of the rest of what was happening in the world. So I first want to start by the humility that I have about that experience. And in fact, people asking me during COVID, you must be growing. And I was, I felt so bad, really. It's, it was almost like, ooh, I don't, I just, we, and we donated a ton of money and we got really involved in Black Lives Matter and lots of things I could talk about. But anyway, 
uh, two parts to that question. One is, you know, we were unprepared for the volume just on supply chain side. And, um, uh, you know, I tell the story that the um, our, we have a manufacturing very close partner. We're kind of integrated in, and we make our hair color in Italy and it's in the Lombardy region. And it was the second most hit region uh, next to Wuhan. Now the U.S. Uh, can stand in that space. But at that time, that was the wave because when they traced it back, many people from um, uh, Asia went to Milan because that is what happens around fashion time, mm. by the way, which is, and then the Lombardy region and our region in particular was heavily hit. Uh, and so uh, we were selling hair color, a box of hair color every five seconds. Whoa. Um, and we had probably at that time, nine weeks on hand, because that is a sensible thing to not carry tons of inventory, right? Nine weeks. Um, uh, and so we were selling so much hair color that, you know, we wouldn't have made it after the first week. So um, we went into triage mode and we formed an emergency response team that started meeting at 7 a.m. every single morning from all parts of the company. We now just meet once a week. We still meet on Thursday mornings, the same group. We just now put it down to Thursday, but it was seven days a week. And I and everybody else was working with the Europe Times from about 5, 4.30 or 5.30 in the morning, all the way up to, you know, 10, 8, 10, 9 o'clock at night. Um, and so we did, you know, in retrospect, we just survived. But what we did was we convinced the Italian government that we would make hand sanitizer for free. Interesting. And that's how we kept the factory open. Wow. So there was only two things being made, which was hand sanitizer and filling tubes of Madison Reed hair color. And then we got very creative and we got, we were able to um, get trucks running and we flew in air color. So we just started and we ran out of eight shades on and off out of 59, 60 for maybe a week at a time, two weeks. And then we'd backload it and sell it and send it to people. Then the next problem was the problem related to the distribution centers, which you're all aware of, right? Like every distribution center packing stuff, Amazon, blah, blah, blah. And we just had massive problems there. So we, uh, we stood up ourselves a third distribution center in three weeks. Wow. We so just got, we were just like, we, you know, it was almost like for everybody in the company. And I think the culture we had, we were prepared to kick in, right? We were already working really hard and we were like, this baby's not, this, this is our moment. We're going to, you know, we're going to seize this because the other part, I was getting texts from friends, customers. I have an email that customers reach out to all the time. I was getting hundreds a day of people saying, I'm not going, I feel bad. I'm stuck in my house. I can't look at myself on Zoom. I feel terrible. I can't, you, you know, can you help me? Oh and so God. I realized that there was a correlation in how you felt about yourself. There was this anxiety going on, still going on to some extent, but you felt worse because you just felt like you didn't look good. And so yeah. I was like, oh boy, we got to step up here. So yeah. we stood up our own distribution center. You know, I, I and many people in the company kind of worked day and night for about five months. And then we, you know, just, we have tons of inventory now. We've put a whole, we've hired a global supply chain. I mean, we had to build infrastructure that was crazy that we never had before. So it was like triage management, but we were somewhat prepared in a mindset that nothing was going to stop us and our customers came first. That's interesting. And so my guess is the emergency response team was all of that same mindset and everybody on whom you needed to lean. Uh, it, it was like, you know, and I look now and, you know, I, we are living, my family is living in Sonoma right now. We, we have a house in San Francisco, but we are, we've been here and we have in a massive backyard, which has become my office. Um, so I have people three to four times a week coming up, sitting in the back distance, and because I'm, a, I don't believe you can manage people just on Zoom. Mm -hmm. And so we were having literally meetings in my backyard, like, you know, we have a huge circle and we were triaging, you know, and I would say, no, once a week, you're all coming up here and we're going to like, how are you? What's going on? 
And we had people like, honestly, in the rear view mirror, they had little kids in home. They, you know, they were going through their own, like everybody else, like we were going through trauma. You know, I got a kid in Kathy, you know, that's in, who was in 11th grade then who lost the second half of that year and has lost almost her senior year. So we right. had, we had life issues going on and my, our people had, you know, seven-year-old that was all of a sudden homeschooled and they're going, I have to get up at four o'clock in the morning. We have people that I think, you know, we did some things. We, number one, we gave mental health services for free and, you know, on the internet and 60%, I mean, it's obviously anonymous at times more than 60% of our team members have used it. 60%. That's incredible. Because they first just all, needed somebody to talk to. Yeah. I mean, first of all, that you did that. And second of all, that how many availed themselves of that service? It's really an insight. Well, yeah. It, it, you know, that we decided that our calls, our stores, right? At that time, we had 12. Yeah, people maybe, are loving have, this, by the way. I just have to interrupt you. People are loving this. They can't even get over this. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, you know, we had all these licensed colorists in our stores, we closed on March 13th with 12 stores, right? <laughs> so we had 200 colorists and we had to make a decision about like, do these people just lose their jobs? And I and the team was like, no, like they were gonna come out the other side of this. We have a call center of colorists. We just decided let's move them all over to the call center not furlough anybody. Uh -huh. And in the matter of 10 days, we took all the team members that were in the stores, sent them Google Chromebooks, finding 200 Google Chromebooks was like the hardest thing, <laughs> sent them with headsets and literally trained them over two weekends. And in 10 days, they were up and running. And thank God we did it because our calls were coming. We we just said, we're not furloughing people, we're moving them. To this day, 35, I think, never went back to the stores. They're really? just like, I love this. We are now, we have now have 30 stores open. So we never had to, some people just opted out for family leave and things, but the bulk of our team members stayed and had jobs. So I want to share one other thing, because this is really critical. The average colorist in the U.S., the average colorist in the U.S. comes out of cosmetology school $23,000 in debt. A year? Just, no, just going to school. It's like a two-year program. Oh, oh, oh. Take a loan for $23,000. Oh, okay, okay, got it, got it, got it. The average colorist, not the person that you go to, the average colorist is um, makes $15 an hour in the U.S. I want to understand how those numbers work. Right. They don't work. It is a systemic system of putting mostly women in jobs where they cannot get ahead not in this company no. and so part of our mission is most of our colorists whether it's call center or in the stores make two to three x what they've ever made with benefits if they're full-time we were not even in the hardest moments going to let those people down that no. was our job yeah and now it's like the stores are open it's on it's crazy in our stores the it's the person you talk to who's the firefighter. I know her. Yeah. It's like she had an experience which was honest. Like this company valued me for my talents. And when it was hard and tough, we got we got going. We didn't let them down. And what that does, and I'm going to say this to anybody, they will never let you down. When you yeah. invest in people's future and their heart, that is where the magic is. When you tell the truth and you mean it, and you stay, stay to it, even when the, you know what, it's the fan. Yep. That's because in the long run, what are you building? Are you building a company for that month or are you building a company for the future? Yeah. It's you, it's the definition of having their back and that's astounding. Yeah. And you know, so we are team oriented. I look, I get up every morning and here's how I think about this. Like, yeah, the product has to be great. Continue. The technology has to be awesome. And our, we're coming out with a mobile app in about a week, which is awesome. You, we have photo recognition now that we can take it. All that stuff's great. But at the end of the day, sorry about the noise. Solar oh, it's panels. Okay. I was like, really? At this time? Okay. I know. But it's um, okay. We're in Zoom land. We, okay. We all right. That's it. right. Okay. Yeah. So um, I get up every morning and here's what the North Star is for me. There's, primary, there's a woman sitting in Bethesda, Maryland, who went to cosmetology school, who's $23,000 in debt, has two kids at home. 
she's homeschooling them and she's scared to death to lose her job. Um, my job and my team's job is to change her life. If she performs, our job is to change her life and every other person's life that goes into that store and is putting it all out on the field for yeah. us. That's my job. And this is, I, I just want to stop, first of all, because I think people, their heads may explode if I don't read some of these tweets um, or the chats. But the second thing is, guys, when you, for those of you who are Madison Reed customers and there's something about it and you just can't quite put your finger on, this is it, right? And you experience that when you're interacting with the company, even on the website, you experience that if you've ever been into a color bar and it matters. And what we're hearing from you is that it really matters. Um, Carly says, it's so refreshing to see an employer actually feel responsible for the security and well-being of their employees. Um, we've got Diana who says, I have never used your product, but you have made a new customer. It is so important to take care of your employees and simply care about others and not just maximizing uh, profit. Talking about your authentic leadership, people who are just blown away at your level, the CEO being so engaged and trying to find, you know, this person now is on a mission, Samira, to find other companies with similar leadership engagement with its people. Somebody's calling this uh, I'm in humane entrepreneurship. And yeah, it's, it's incredible. The rea my goal, thank you. My goal has a name now. So this is really inspiring for people who are thinking about entrepreneurship, um, who are consumers, you know, and just want to be yeah. associated with something positive. You know, here's the thing. We make mistakes. So I do not, I, I am, a tr I'm, maybe if sometimes I'm too transparent during the process. We make mistakes, but we're and we are the kind of company that will come towards somebody saying like, oh my God, you know what, of course, make, you know, that is part of the deal, that transparency, because what you want your team members is for them to be able to make mistakes, right? Yes. Matter that. But at the end of the day, like, here's, here's what I will just share with you. Your people are everything. They're always everything. And every step of the way as you get bigger, it gets harder. Culture gets harder to hold on to. You have to get people who then I can't keep being, I'm not the only one that spreads the mission. So we spend a lot of time training about what I would call the hospitality, the Madison Reed way, I call it. Okay. We have a different way. If it's wrong, we're going to make it right for you, whatever it takes. And what I understand, like as the company grows and flourishes, it gets harder because the unit economics get harder. And people want to grind you down about your people. Not here. Not going to happen. No. It's an, and we, we actually have some, some questions here um, that I just want to try to get in real quick. Um, what about Ulta, Whole Foods, yeah. Walmart? What yeah. about the cost? Ulta, Whole Foods, Walmart. And then there's another one about the podcast. People yeah, so are Ulta, with your podcast. The only, the only other way, way you could buy Madison Reed is in Ulta. We're in every single Ulta store in Ulta.com. We okay. beat those numbers by 40% last year, even with stores being closed. Okay. So there's a very close partnership. We are not in Walmart. Um, uh, I don't remember the other name you. So we are in Alta. They are the place for hair. And we are, will, we are not, you're not going to find this in Walgreens, CVS, all of those places. We're a prestige hair color brand. We need to keep the brand at a place where there's a differentiation. Of course, you can buy our product at any of our 30 um, hair color bars and more to come. We'll open 25 new ones this year. And then who writes the podcast for you guys? Carly is um, really- We don't have it. We don't have a podcast yet. She says, who writes the amazing- Oh, podcast ads. Okay. Oh, the ads for Madison. Yeah. 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 Uh, our, our internal are into, hi, hello, beautiful. I'm Amy Ear. Is that the one you're talking about? Oh, she knows uh, it by heart. Yeah. Um, I, uh, it's written. We have a whole creative internal and then I work with them and I have learned the art of doing those with a blanket over my head. Uh, in my house in Sonoma, literally, I go into my blanket over my head because the only way you could keep sound used to go into a radio studio. Uh, but we write them internally and they're all I about like affirming that. people. A blanket over your head. That's amazing. All right. And we have Ellen Lang, who's actually the mother of a student of one of my of one of my students oh, great. in the business. She has like a skincare line. So she really awesome. so she yeah. really knows what you're going through. And uh, she says, what do you think is your best method of reaching customers, advertising or being in retail, something else? Uh, I think it's 
uh, the way I put it, building a brand is everything. So it's every touch point, it's every box that comes to you with a message, it's every email, it's every billboard, it's everything that's in the store, it's every time I, you know, everyone from our company uses a background of Zoom. And the reason it's your signature on the emails you send, your brand is the soul of your company. Everything has to reflect that. Facebook ads, radio, podcasts, TV commercials now, and it is not like they are not in, you know, direct mail. It is all integrated into the same message of affirmation all the time. Yeah. And what people don't understand is they think brand is marketing. No, no. Brand is how people perceive your company. You know it when you see it, right? Like I'm a Peloton user. Okay. Mm -hmm. When you get on your Peloton and you're working out, you're like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> Okay. GW alum co-founder. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, yeah. So we aspire that every time you see, you hear my voice, you see something, what do you, what you, what we want you to feel is you're a badass. You got this and don't let anybody tell you, you don't have this. You got it. Life is hard, but you know what? You got it. Yeah. I love it. This is amazing. Maybe you can come out with a line of other things like a well, it's, for the soul calendar, but it's going to be, <laughs> you, never know. And read. you never know. Yeah. People, no, people are just going crazy. We're going to run out of time guys, just so you know. So I'll try to squeak in a couple other things here. Sure. Um, one is that you all just raised $50 million. Mm -hmm. You pretty much you know, explain the way venture capitalists think about this, but how did you do all this? This is a whole nother job during COVID, during the yeah. emergency response group. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I am the most blessed person in the world. I get up every morning and I think, wow, you know, we have a saying in Madison Reed, which we talk about a lot. Um, most people live their life and they say the following, I have to do this. No, actually no one has to do anything. I yeah. get to do this. I and this team gets the honor to do this. So, you know, we get to serve our customers. We, you know, we choose it and we get to. So, you know, we have had very supportive investors. We've raised a lot of money. Um, yes, that was in the middle of this whole, you know, you know what going yeah. on, but you know, we, we had it under control and we were able to do that. There were big plans for the company coming up. Um, you know, we're, we're into harder and more difficult kinds of problems, but we're going to solve them. There's nothing that's going to stop us. Uh, and it may not, it's not going to be the same linear line. If I said it to you today, it won't happen exactly that way. I want to be open to what is the truth in the universe and not the lies we tell ourselves as I talk about in the company all the time. You know, every, every company has the lies you tell yourself. Yes. So your, our customers, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, uh, maybe not. Right. Exactly. So we have to have the courage to hear what's not working. There's a lot of people that didn't get boxes on time. There's a lot of people who were pissed. Like all those things are true. And we are, we have really tried, you know, here's, a, here's what it is. People make mistakes, but what I call the intent of the heart. If you have the intent of the heart to make it right, then it's okay. And so look, great things are, you know, happening. There'll be some hard things that happen. That's life. But look for this company. We're not this, this, uh, this baby's gone over the goal line. Oh, so, yeah. We believe yeah. it. And yeah. Lexi and I, there's so many other questions. There's questions coming in, but we have to wrap up. I'll end with um, a comment from Eva and then uh, the ICSB president who helped put on this uh, great day with his team along with the GW School of Business. Eva says, Congratulations. It's tough, but everything matters. I agree. And I am thankful for this opportunity to hear this story. I learned a lot. And then Ayman, who is the president of the International Council of Small Business, putting on this conference along with the GW School of Business. Amy, you have touched our hearts at GW and ICSB. You also shared valuable knowledge. Thank you for your gifts. I couldn't agree more. Um, Thank you for having me. I really feel honored to be on it. Keep doing what you're all doing. Um, this kind of dialogue and getting other people on here, if I could be helpful about that, Kathy, call on me. And uh, many people don't know this, but Kathy and I have a personal connection, which is um, my cousin, who I adore, is a very close friend of Kathy's. And 
Um, this, this person has been my cousin, a very important mentor in my life. So this is an honor to just pay it forward. I love it. We, and, and that's a wonderful um, note to end on because when you talk about self-care and how you meditate every day and the Peloton, I think we're picking up some of these things for the how to support Amy equation. And we've got your cousin, got your yeah. aunt, we've got Madison Reed, we've yeah. got your wife. You know, uh, the, you the, think thing, about that. the trick of this that I want to leave folks is your path will be difficult. So your job is to take care of yourself so that you position yourself to win. And that is self care. If you're not good, the company can't be good. And that's a hard thing to get. It took me a lot of years to realize like grinding myself down was not good for anybody. So like take that time to self care, that half an hour, that 45 minutes is everything. And then you're good to go. Then you live it all out on the field. Wonder twin powers activate. Exactly. <laughs> and and as long as your really, hair looks good, get that hair. Looking. I know. And people are re really resonating with the self-care message and the support that you are really transparent about needing why we need it and, and what you plug in in your life. So I really appreciate that. I know Lexi does too. We talk a lot about this offline and in women's entrepreneurship and in our regular entrepreneurship classes, right? We got to have that ener energy from somewhere. So it doesn't just come automatically from the sky. <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, thanks so much, Amy. Happy International Thank Women's you. Day. Go Madison Reed. Back, back at you. Okay. Right. Thanks. See you. Bye. Bye.